It's Tuesday, April 9th. I'm Adam Walsh, and this is The Signal. And we are live from Gander again today. The eclipse may be behind us, but we are still thinking about the skies. We are talking about aviation history at Gander International Airport Lounge. And as that theme music fades, you're going to start to get a feel of uh, a few decades ago with the music playing in the background here. Uh, I will say the Gander International Airport Lounge, it's a uh, one of my favorite spots to be in, just because of the feel of the place. Uh, Reg Wright, Gander Airport Authority CEO, is in front of me now. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Th look, thanks for coming on the show. Um, the way the show is going to work, we're going to kind of talk about the present for the first half, sure. right, and with the outlook for the airport. And then in the second half of the show, we're going to take a trip back to the history of, of this place and talk about some real great uh, great stories of uh, who used to be here and what was going on over the, the decades. How does one become CEO of this place, anyways? Like, how do you like? How do you get to be you, and like, in this position? <laughs> I think you apply more than anything. Yeah, I'm Gander born and bred, so uh, I, you know, aviation was the backdrop of my youth. So I still have the best job in Gander right now. So I'm happy to be here. So yeah, you build up, and all of a sudden, you send the resume, and you're like, hey, I finally made it. Yeah. What's the operations like here right now? What, like, to, to talk about the airport and the current state of it. Well, the current state is, I think we're sort of suffering a, a form of long COVID, if I could put it that way. Yeah. So there's still still a fair amount of recovery coming out of the pandemic. Yeah. And things haven't moved along quite as fast as we'd hoped in some cases. Operations have stabilized a fair bit, and I think we're still creeping toward normal, but mm -hmm. not quite there yet. So what do you need? More flights, more routes, more choice, more seat capacity. Uh, and more passengers. How know. does that happen? Well, it's it's an active pursuit. I think one of the most frustrating things uh, as an airport manager is uh, you spend a lot of time trying to compel airlines to provide service in a way that's profitable for, for them. And uh, all you can do is give your best business case. And the post-pandemic landscape for air service is very different. You saw there was a very acute pilot shortage that was you know sort of in play even before the pandemic hit, and it just got exasperated mm -hmm. as they jettison you know staff to try to survive so there's that and some airline co consolidation hasn't really helped that much and combine those things with some economic factors including inflation so it's been a tough time to grow that must be awfully frustrating to be the ceo of gander airport when you're when you're coming into the town and you see like you know crossroads of the world and then you're there trying to convince airlines to continue the rich aviation history of this place by having a functioning airport yeah and it's even more frustrating when there's credible business cases for yeah. airlines to serve our market we're only two-thirds recovered from where we were post pandemic so it's not like the market doesn't exist what doesn't exist is the level of service to accommodate demand and that's frustrating because ultimately I don't make those decisions. I can, you know, airlines make air service decisions, airports don't. Yeah. It's a bit like running the mall. You know, you want to have all kinds of traffic and get all the right mix of retailers, but those retailers decide. So whether I want Randy River or Roots or whatever it might be, all I can do is make a business case. Mm. And I think the business case is compelling, but it hasn't resonated quite yet. What do you think then? How do you get to that resonating point? Is it just about them, you know, changing their minds, or is there like a provincial or a federal, or is there some kind of a something that can help move things along here? I think we've all sort of rallied as communities yeah. and community leaders to try to, you know, coalesce around this message that we need more service, but we're not going to solve uh, the pilot shortage ourselves. Pilots don't no. come from vending machines. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it's a there's a lot of skill and a lot of hours that goes into getting there. It's it's a bigger problem. And you know, Gander's not alone. I, I knew right in the midst of the pandemic that we'd be one of the last dogs to the bowl of recovery yeah. and that's what's been proven out so the only strategy right now is uh, we're talking to every airline with an operating certificate who's got a meaningful opportunity and we're just gonna keep on keeping on okay uh, sit tight we're gonna talk about history down a little bit if you don't mind the second half of the show but I appreciate the, the look at now and the talk about you know what matters and, and why it's so important for sure. this community so that's Reg right there Gander Airport Authority uh, CEO we're gonna spin through we got the uh, Pat White is here. Come on down. How you doing? Good, sir. CEO, <clears throat> president, founder. Uh, so it's Gander Flight Training, and remind me of the company again. Evis Air. Evis Air. There you yeah. go. Yeah. You've been around for a little bit. Yes, I've been around since the Dead Sea was only sick. Long time, Adam. <laughs> yeah. 
how's business these days? Yeah, well, business, as uh, Reg was saying about the global pilot shortage, is a bit of an advantage to us in that uh, flight training is yeah. uh, busy. Yeah. And, uh, and also due to the lack of ability of many airlines to respond to other demands, like charter uh, is busy these days, and our air ambulance operation at Agander is busy. And we've also diversified in a number of areas, the modification of aircraft into cargo aircraft and air ambulance aircraft. And of course, we have uh, we handle all the cargo flights coming in to Gander, and so it's quite quite busy at what we do. How many pilots you got coming in? Because so the last time I was at your spot was uh, a couple years ago, doing a story on an old buddy of mine who was uh, going from parachuting in the military to flying planes, mm -hmm. and I was I knew nothing about uh, the location, right? But yeah. there were uh, some folks from Thailand there who were learning to yes. fly. So, what's the international flavor there now, and how many pilots are kind of get, getting trained up? Well, the international flavor is still strong. There's some issues recently with the recent announcement of the federal government on restricting uh, student visas and so on. So that's a bit of a complication for us, so we're working through that. But the great news is Gander is a fantastic airport, a great place to learn how to fly. Mm. Uh, you wouldn't say it today, but the weather is very good here for flying. Mm. And, and it's a balance because, you know, we have uh, a, a lot of good weather for flying, but we also have uh, some challenging weather that actually at the end of the course makes for a, a better pilot in, yeah. the, in the training side. And also, too, we're in the business of modifying aircraft to adapt new satellite technology and so on that al helps us mitigate some of the weather issues. So these are the things that we do to keep us busy and keep everybody over there working. And So what do you think then for functioning and operations for the health of Gander and the, the international airport stuff. What, like, to, to build off of what Reg is saying, what, what do you think is needed here? Yeah, uh, I echo what Reg is saying is uh, absolutely correct. Uh, there's a significant market here, but encouraging airlines in this environment to put the type of capacity here that we know uh, can work is a challenge. So in the meantime, we need to focus on general aviation activities. What I mean by general aviation activities is like our water bombing operation is here search and rescue is here. We're doing significant air ambulance work out of here now. And of course, everybody knows that there's a strong lobby to uh, to s establish permanent air ambulance operation here, uh, putting the ambulance closer to the patient than it would be, uh, for example, in St. John. So building on that general aviation also gives revenue within the company to be able to diversify out into the manufacturing and maintenance, repair, overhaul. And having the College of the North Atlantic here is a huge asset with their aircraft maintenance program, their structures program, their avionics program. So all of these things bode well for the future of Gander, but it takes, as Reg says, it takes the community, it takes work. The town and the mayor have been fantastically supportive. Reg and the group here at the airport are some of the best I've ever dealt with across the country. So, you know, we have a strong, cohesive group here in Gander, and we will survive, but uh, there are some rough waters ahead. We just got to keep at her. Is there anything else you would like to see? So you mentioned issues with some uh, for student visas for pilots. Uh, yes. So that's one. So is that something you would like to see change? Oh, yeah, that is a disaster. Uh, you know, I understand where the federal government is coming from on immigration and how it ties its issues to housing and so on. But, you know, the one size fits all that the federal government often brings to the table is a problem. Like, uh, you know, we're not really have a problem with uh, we need the immigrants here uh, in Newfoundland. If you look at our population, they're all old like me. And uh, so we need young people coming here and some that uh, come to learn how to fly uh, go back but some stay so they're uh, crucial to the future of the airport the future of our operation Tell folks about, uh, if you don't mind, a bit about your history. Because you, I mean, for your flight history, you were a bush pilot up in Labrador. I mean, you've been doing stuff for, like you said, uh, a while. So just k tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I came here to learn how to fly all through a fluke, actually. In uh, 1972, I got first time I got close to an airplane, I got in it to learn how to fly it. And uh, so it's over 50 years now. And I've been blessed, I guess you could say, with what a career in the bush flying business and water bombing business. I spent a huge amount of time on the Labrador. As I tell people, first when I flew on the coast of Labrador, there were no such thing as runways and, you know, the and radio only worked probably 20 miles out of Goose Bay and then you were on your own. There was Shagall navigation equipment.
equipment, and you had to say over on the telephone, let alone the radio. Wow. And uh, but I just loved uh, what I did with a passion. I lived with a vengeance for it, and uh, I'm a little bit dismayed at this stage in life. I am in the management of business and ownership of business, but none of it is much fun as sitting up in the pointy end of the airplane and doing the stuff that we did back in the day. And to be fair, a lot of that environment uh, is gone. But Newfoundland and Labrador is such a fantastic place to fly and have a career. Uh, it is really a, a place of, if you have the passion for flying, this is the place to be. Hmm. Well, it, especially you know when we're standing in the uh, International Airport Lounge, right? The Gander International Lounge, and with all the history of this place, uh, it, it it is always a favorite of mine to talk about the 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 aviation history. What's something that like is a favorite of yours when you think of the history of of here when it comes to all the stories? Well, first of all, this place is what I call goosebump real estate, right? You know, like it gives you the goosebumps. And uh, but you know, for me, it's been uh, back in the day flying the mail to Fogo Island and Change Islands. I did the last flight into Twillingate Island with the mail, for example. And you were landing on ponds, and over in Change Islands, you landed on the bog, and so a lot of that that was a lot of fun. I remember taking a passenger from the mainland one time and circling for a landing in Change Islands and out of the corner of my eye I could watch his head twisting and turning looking for the runway and as we lined up to land on the bog his eyes were as big as a saucer by the time we touched down, right, you know. So, uh, and all the people that you got to meet with and the weather that you had to work with and so it was just a fantastic time. But again, uh, the air traffic control system here in Gander, the people here in Gander, uh, they've always been fantastic to deal with. So I've been blessed. I've had a really good career. Pat, thanks for this chat. I know you're a busy person and much appreciate you taking time for it. You're more than welcome. Thank you for the invitation. All right, Patrick White there, uh, President and CEO, so Gander Flight Training and uh, founder of Evis Air. Let's bring on uh, Dana Young into the conversation now. So Dana's a, got two hats that uh, that he's wearing, right? So instructor, aircraft programs, College of the North Atlantic, Gander Campus, as well as director uh, on the board for the North Atlantic Aviation Museum. So talk to me about uh, these two hats. I guess let's go uh, CNA instructor first, then we'll go with the history. Okay, well, I teach, um, I teach electronics courses or avionics courses at CNA. CNA. It was never my plan to teach. I went there as a demonstrator because someone suggested it and over time they forced me to start teaching because yeah. I, I was kicking and screaming saying I, I can't get up in front of a class but of course once I got into it now I wouldn't change it for anything and I've been there now 17 years so. So tell me about this, like how does this program work? What, what kind of jobs are people getting from this program? Well um, really can go right from NASA right on down the line. Any kind of aviation maintenance jobs. Um, mm. We also have a structures program there too, so it could be anything to do with the structure of the aircraft, the avionics of the aircraft, the mechanical, helicopters, piston engine, turbine engine. So we cover it all. Wow. And uh, now for jobs, uh, last our students last year had a choice between three and four jobs each because the baby boomers are all retiring. Three and four jobs. They had three each. or four choices each last year. Yeah. Now when I when I graduated, I didn't have any choice. I graduated right after 9/11. Oh, right. But then about six months later, Pal called me, so I went in St. John's and worked at Provincial for a yeah. couple of years and eventually came back to Gander for Briggs Aero, and uh, then the college job came up. So that's how I ended up where I am now. How many, so how many folks we have in a class? Um, we, our classes are usually a maximum of 16. We can take 20, yeah. but we usually lose a few in the fall that aren't sure if that's what they want to do. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, 16 is, is the proper class size for us maximum because for the amount of equipment we have. What do you think about the state of the avi aviation industry right now? Because I know you mentioned hey, three or four offers each because of the, uh, the baby boomers retiring. So it's yeah. good for getting into jobs because there's vacancies. Good for jobs now, better than it has ever been. And the wages have gone up a lot. Uh, I heard someone say the other day that there, there was a company looking for a couple of people right out of school and they think they were offering $33 an hour right out of school, no experience. 33 bucks an hour right out of school, that's, yeah. I mean, that's really good. So it depends on where you go, it's a wide range, but uh, it's it, all the pays are up and everybody's desperate. So now airlines and, and companies are coming to us before they're graduated to try and convince them to go with them when they're done. And where are people then going with these jobs? Where are these jobs based? Well, fair number stay on the island with mm -hmm. Provincial Airlines and Cougar and, and companies like that and Evis. But um, Jazz comes after many in Air Canada. Uh, IMP are always down here looking for people. And uh, now out west, there's a lot more jobs. So there's, there's no limit. Like, they definitely have three or four choices again this year. How long is this course? 
Two years. Two years. Two years if you want the, the maintenance course. If you want the structural course, it's 10 months. The two years doesn't include the summers, of course, so two 10-month stretches for right maintenance. All right. And then, uh, and like the uptake, like it typically full, hey? Yeah, uh, yeah. We have a wait list, but we find by September that it drops off a little bit because people put their names in for more than one program. Yeah, you're just trying to figure out what you want to do yeah, in life. And and sometimes like, if oh. the one comes up close to home, they may go and do automobile because it's next door, or, and mm -hmm. even if they wanted to try something different. So. Right on. All right, talk to me about that other hat now. <laughs> okay, the other hat. Uh, I will mention, though, by the way, yeah. uh, males and females. We're getting we get a fair number of females. The industry is friendly to either or. Yeah. So it's not a male-based industry anymore. It used to be thought of that way, but that's not the case. So I thought I'd mention that. Yeah, no, open for everyone. Yes. There you yeah. go. That's and good, good as plug. for the other yeah. hat, um, someone suggested that I uh, add myself to the board at the museum. I got nominated, and I was on the fence about it, but I said yes. And so for the last, I think, five or six years now, I've been on the museum board. But I like uh, doing upkeep to the aircraft, coming up with new displays for the museum, especially interactive things. Because I think the kids and uh, younger people like things that are moving and make noise than just quiet things. So I've been I've been doing a few things. I animated the cockpit that sticks out the back of the museum. And so at the North Atlantic Aviation Museum. So in the back of it, there's a co what's the cockpit's from what kind of a plane? Interesting enough, it's a DC-3, as, as so we thought, yeah. the EPA aircraft, originated in Gander. But what we didn't realize is when I did a serial number search and I started to restore it, I found a couple large World War II bullet holes in the side of it that were covered up. And uh, they work out to be either Japanese Zero or anti-aircraft. So when I did a search, it spent its whole war for the USAAF in the South Pacific, right in the combat zone. And no one realized it. And so it's a C-47. It's not really a DC-3. At the North Atlantic Aviation Museum, the cockpit in the back, that and folks can sit in it? Yeah. Uh, well, now what happens if you walk in, it'll say, Welcome aboard Eastern Provincial Airlines. And I, I put screens in the windshield, so it'll actually take you through a little flight now. It used to just sit there static, but now it does a little more. So. And it has two bullet holes from the... Well, I've gone up to five bullet holes five so Five bullet holes, sorry. Five started bullet with two. holes. Started with and two. Now I'm up to five that I've found so far, so the, uh, now I know why it's always been hard to stop the leaks. I think it's full of bullet holes. Because, from the Asia-Pacific Theater? Yeah, it in was World in the... It started at the very beginning, and it was there to the end, and then Philippine Airlines took it after that, so... It spent the whole Took war there. Took it for there. what? To, to fly still? Then it, 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 went to, it went to probably six or seven companies after that before EPA got it. Yeah, so it's, it's got a long history of flight, but uh, all of World and War II, it was there. It feels like it just wants to be up in the air because... <laughs> yeah, well, that was only the cockpit. Uh, the rest of it is gone, but uh, hey. it's, it's an interesting piece. Oh, that's a fascinating piece. Yeah. Um, you got you're working on a grant, or there's a, so tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, we've applied for a grant in December to uh, make a digital display of all of older pieces of aviation history around Gander, including the old airport, but specifically crash sites that are kind of forgotten in the backwoods. So, um, if it works out and we get it, we're going to add a lot to the display for the crash sites, which isn't really at the museum now, only for the well-known ones. Give people an understanding of the number of crash sites around here. Ones that I consider close enough to Gander to be part of Gander for sure, at least 20. 20? At least 20, yeah. And, and that includes one in the lake, but there may be a few more in the lake, not counting uncrashed aircraft that are supposed to be at the bottom of the lake. So, And we're going to send a dive team down in the spring to bring up an artifact from the B-24 in the lake. Um, to display in the museum once it's done. That's another little thing, a side project we're doing. Why is it so important to remember these crashes and to get funding to, to create something so more people can, uh, can know about them? Important piece of history, and I think if it's left too long, it'll just disappear. Yeah. And uh, some people always wonder, should we walk on a, a crash site that's really a grave site? But the way I always think of it is, if I was one of those passengers or soldiers, depending on if it's military or not, I think I'd rather want to be remembered than forgotten. Mm. So, I mean, once, once the, if it's a crash site that's in the backwoods and it's never visited and it's, it's kind of forgotten, but it's, you're kind of wiped out. But uh, it'd be good to bring that back where everybody can see it and be remembered rather than Well, you're right, because there comes a point in time when everyone, the folks who are living, forget about it. That's right. And then it's just next generation the It's not a crash site in the woods anymore. Maybe there's a plaque or something, but it gets, you're right, it gets completely yeah. forgotten. Yeah, so that's, that's what I think. I think it's best to, to, to preserve the history. And there's so much of it hidden around Gander that a lot of people don't even realize what's here. I'm, I'm sure I only know about two-thirds of it at the most. There's probably more than I even know about that are hidden.
give folks uh, I know there's a, we could do a show or a couple of shows just on crash sites but uh, give sure. folks a, a another interesting bit of history that really like, they, that's really piqued your curiosity about these uh, about a certain crash site here well um, there's a there's one in behind Gander Lake that there's a couple elderly people have told me about when they were growing up they used to crawl up inside the cockpit and play in it and it's not one on my list of marked aircraft I know a rough idea but that's my holy grail I got to get over there one of these days with the help of these people and see if I can find that one because it'd be nice to find something mostly intact yeah so that you can if you can crawl inside it it's different than the little pieces on the ground but it would be nice if that's that's my been my holy grail if that still exists and if it's out there I want to see it any idea what it might be B24 or B17 bomber American Right. From what I understand, yeah. A lot of these planes are USAF aircraft yeah. that are in the woods. And there's a few Canadian, but most of them are American, believe it or not, American bombers. Mm. And also, I think we had, like, all together on this island, there's been, like, eight uh, hurricanes, which is a single-man fighter plane. Eight hurricanes, there's eight or nine V-24s around Gander, three V-17s, I think, and the rest are various other... The aircraft so and the time frame for years roughly for, for uh, the range most of them are World War two where yeah. we were the the uh, stopover point on the way overseas right the ferry command but uh, there are a few that of course are later and civilian ones so so there you go it's large large uh, variety of crash sites around Dana thanks for this nice You're chat welcome. I know you got to get back I think uh, you left a class and told him to do a do an assignment yeah. sheet to get back to them so back in class shortly all, all right. right I appreciate it you're welcome all right Dana Young their instructor aircraft programs College of the North Atlantic Gander campus and director on the board for North Atlantic Aviation Museum I'm Adam Walsh this is the signal and uh, yeah with that jazz playing in the background I don't know if you folks can hear it but it's uh, playing here in the uh, the Gander International lounge as we uh, you know yesterday was all about the eclipse and today we figured let's stick with the skies we're doing a, a whole show on well the current operations in and around gander right because it, but then it's also the rich history of this place for for aviation so reg wright uh gander airport authority ceo is uh, back again so we talked about the current operations right and where things are at but let's let's go back to the beginning tell me about how this all started here the airport started yeah yeah i mean I think the airport started back when transatlantic flight was in its infancy yeah. and you know beyond the ferry command which saw you know 10,000 North American built bomber bombers shuttled into Europe to fell Hitler uh, after that was sort of Gander's heyday when the early transatlantic flights all whether you liked it or not you were stopping at Gander so this this is what earned the airport its name as crossroads of the world the, the lounge Tell everyone, it, a lot of folks will have heard about it, but I, I can keep hearing about it, to be honest. Like, tell folks about the lounge. Well, the lounge was, was opened in 1959. Basically, all these people who were, who were flying in the North Atlantic at the time stopped at a very utilitarian space across the field. So the government of Canada said, this is not the impression of a young and ambitious nation that we want these global jet setters to get. So as a result, they produced the lounge here. And the lounge was supposed to bring together the best in art, design, and architecture to showcase us as a modern nation that wasn't just about, you know, hockey sticks and maple syrup and Celine Dion. And, and so, none of those are in this lounge right now. No, no, they've <laughs> kept those out. But I mean, this, this idea, you know, this was the, the brand of, of a new nation. And yeah. everyone who stopped here, this was the impression that they wanted to make of Canada at the time. Describe the lounge for me. I don't for, know if there's a radio good, audience. I don't know if there's a good word. I, I always use the word retrolicious, and uh, you know, old old things are new again. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's it's I think Canada's best preserved modernist space at the time. And you'll know if you've ever been to an IKEA or, or a furniture store. Mid-century modernism never dies, and the architecture here never dies. And uh, it's always cool, and it's always Mad Men, and it's always something that people are drawn to. What's your favorite bit about this place? But this place, yeah. I like the flooring. I think the <laughs> trousel, really I, nice. honestly, I think the trousel flooring ties it all together. I've got tons of favorites, but, uh, you know, the clocks, the murals, the, the station wagon style paneling on Newfoundland's first escalator, I like all that stuff, but I think the flooring in particular resonates with me. Yeah. And is there, from all the folks who kind of shuffled through here over the years, back when everyone was shuffling through here, who is it that kind of speaks the most to you? 
I think this one who was probably uh, a totem or an icon at the time would have to be Sinatra. Yeah. You know, who bought it in a line at the bar here and, you know, shopped downtown and all those things. But in that day, Gander really did attract the constellation of stars because, you know, all these people were flying commercial at the time and, and travel back then was the prerogative of the rich. Mm. So that's all you saw. Now, you know, there's still... I don't know daily, but on a weekly basis, the world's movers and shakers are through the airport. Yeah. They're not necessarily in this room, yeah. but they, they do they do transit through the airport. Right on. Yeah. Reg, thanks for this. My pleasure. All right, I'll let you get Take back to running the airport. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> Reg Wright there, uh, Gander Airport Authority CEO. Jack Pinson's going to make uh, an appearance on the show now. So, well, Jack, uh, Gander Airport Historical Society... You've been, you've lived here your whole what well, since you were two, I believe. Retired air traffic controller. Tell me about when you and your family, or you and your mom, got to Gander. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, families weren't allowed in Gander during Second World War. Yeah. My father worked here, so my mother and I lived in Gamble. I, actually, we boarded a house in, in a place in Gamble. So my father used to uh, commute back and forth on the train every weekend, right? So that's, <laughs> and we we lived like that until the war was over, and then we moved into Gander. And and uh, and at that time, uh, if you uh, go on our website, you can get the census. We've got a census for 1945, and I think there's about 200 and 270s, 280 odd people uh, lived in Gander after the second, right after the uh, the war was over. You know. And I guess everyone was just scattered around the airport too, right? Like once things got were being built, like where, where was the housing situation like? Oh, it was just they just they renovated the military buildings, yeah. barracks and things like that. You know, yeah. it was all in place, but they made them into apartments. Yeah. You know, so uh, um, the um, the American side, which was the USAF, USAAF air uh, base, and then there was the RCAF base, they were heated by with steam heated. There were steam heaters from from uh, uh, big furnaces that provided the uh, steam. But the army side, which is where we, we live, the the, uh, the uh, Canadian Army at each barracks had its own furnace. Mm. So, but when we moved in there, they took the furnaces out and we just gave us coal and wood stove. So, uh, you know, that's how we heated the place. What was it like growing up around this airport? Oh man, it was something else. As a kid growing up. I, I remember there, there was a, a, a during the war they were so uh, they were just afraid of an enemy attack like they did at Pearl Harbor. So what they did they built dummy guns around the airport. There was I think there was three anti-aircraft guns on wooden platforms. Would uh, they would actually move? <laughs> so um, <clears throat> uh, when we lived on the Army side. The old runway 1836 was never very active, but used to, the airplanes used to come in. And if we see the airplanes lining up to come in the, the land, we hid for this gun. And it would take about four of us, and we're only about six or seven years old. And so we would maneuver this thing. So you, you'd be in the gunner seat and you shoot down one airplane, and then it was your turn down to move the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the thing around. That was the kind of stuff. And then also, they had a, a, um, an airplane dump where they took all the old airplanes and fuselages and he put them in a great big pile. And uh, we used to go up there and rummage around on that looking for <laughs> artifacts, right? That and one time we, found, we found a 50 caliber machine gun. What? So... <laughs> How old were you when you found it? Like, just so you're rummaging through the airplane dump and you find a 50 cal. How old were you for this? About seven, eight years okay, old. Okay, of course, yeah. Well, and it would take us about, uh, it took about four of us to, to get this lug this thing down. Yeah, 50 cows and, and are big. It was, a, it was quite a distance where we wanted to bring it, and we had this fortress made up, so uh, uh, we had to take shortcuts through the woods and all that because we didn't want the big guys to take it away from us, you know. <laughs> so uh, we had this 50 caliber machine gun set up in our fortress, and man, we had some, <laughs> no, nobody could attack us, you know. No, that's so, pretty good. Yeah. Right? That's yeah, the, probably the best fortress for kids I've yeah. ever heard. And, uh, and of course, uh, 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 my mo see, there was a, a very bad accident happened in Gander in 1946, when an airplane came in, an emergency landing, and hit five people, killed them. Oh wow! Right? Oh yeah, chopped them right up in pieces. Right? Yeah. So uh, after that, every child was because we lived pretty close to the to runways. Yeah. So after that. The last words my mother used to say to me, don't go near the runway. That, that, was, the, that was the command, right? Mm. Was, you know, don't go near the runway. So 
and so uh, like th those kind of things that uh, that we're just we're just conscious of it, and we mm. didn't go near the runways. No. You know? Well, of course, went close to them, but didn't go near them. You know. <laughs> yeah, you still got to see uh, what's going on. But you know, uh, uh, like I said, growing up, it was just like, like it was. Uh, uh, there were so many things that we used to, to explore and find and 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 and, and pick out things. But another thing my mother used to say to me was, "And don't go near the airplane dumps, right?" But she used to say it in a double negative: "Don't go near." The, the airplane dump. Yeah. Right? So we didn't go near it. We went into it. <laughs> so, that, so that was our way. You know, say, well, you said don't go near it. I went into it. I, went I into didn't it. know you it didn't mean don't go into it. You yeah. know? So, right. <laughs> but, you know. It's a different thing, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> you're doing that. You're, you're messing around in the airplane dump growing up, staying away from the runway. You grow up, and then you start working here. How do you, what's that first gig like as you work here? Well, uh, I applied. Uh, uh, I was looking for. I was finished in high school, and I, 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 I wasn't I didn't have very good marks to go to university or anything like that. So I was applying on jobs. Yeah. And so I applied on. There was three jobs that were open uh, uh, in high school, and one of them was for air traffic control. So I applied on it. You know. So uh, the morning, the last exam, I went to the post office, and there was a, a letter in the in the. Um, uh, in my mailbox, saying that uh, I report for to the DOT office for, for, for like I, I won the position, so uh, I finished the ex my uh, exam at noon, mm -hmm. and one o'clock I went to work, <laughs> and, uh, and I went to work, and 35 and a half years later <laughs> I retired. So I, to, was a I started off as an assistant, of course, and then yeah. uh, then uh, uh, when I became 21, you had to be 21 to be a controller. Yeah. So at 21, then I went away to ATC school and became a controller. You know, so. Tell folks about the time you lost Dief Diefenbaker. Oh, that's a long <laughs> story. <laughs> Give us the Coles <laughs> Notes version. Dead. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, Diefenbaker was coming down to meet Joey Smallwood for a disagreement they had about some expenses that they incurred over the years. and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the uh, Diefenbaker was coming into uh, Deer Lake on the DOT airplane, and then he was going to transfer into two EPA airplanes and fly in uh, to Gander, uh, Gander first, and then on to St. John's. So I was an assistant in the in the, in the center, and I copied the two flight plans from the EPA on two DC-3s. But n nobody said who was on what airplane. So I took one flight plan and gave it into the uh, into the uh, terminal area where the, the controllers were going to, to look after it, and I looked after the uh, the, visual, the the VFR portion of it. So uh, Jack James and all and all the delegates were down in the main lobby here, and waiting for Diefenbaker to come in, and he had uh, uh, the entourage type thing, you know, flower girls and all that, you know, going to come and meet Diefenbaker, and everybody was sitting around in a relaxed mood because they didn't know, they knew it was going to take a while for their flight to get over from Deer Lake. So Jack James came into the control center and he says, the supervisor is Mr. Diefenbaker off the ground yet. And then, uh, so he went in and checked with the, uh, with the air traffic controller and he says, no, he's still on the ground. But meanwhile, I had a flight plan of another DC-3 that was coming off the ground in Deer Lake. So I got a, a call from uh, the Deer Lake radio and they said, uh, I got a departure for you on this uh, flight. So I took the flight time, uh, the departure time, and calculated the estimate to Gander, passed it along to the tower, and that was it. And uh, forgot about it. And I didn't tell anybody. Nobody told me to, to, to report this uh, information. So the next thing, Jack James comes in again, looking for Mr. Diefenbaker. And he says, no, no, Diefenbaker's still on the ground over in Deer Lake. And he says, OK, fine. So he goes down and tells the crowd, and we'll all sit back and relax. Everybody with their feet up, smoking cigars, and a little girl running around with her flowers. and. You know, and then all of a sudden, the door on the main lobby opens up, and in walks Diefenberger with his two suitcases. <laughs> Prime he was Minister on the Canada. He, he would, <laughs> and well, Jack James hit the ceiling, you know, I tell you. He got so upset because there they were, weren't prepared. I mean, there's Diefenberger bringing in his two suitcases, you know. So uh, anyway, uh, the, the Jack James came up uh, in the control center and started giving the uh, uh, supervisor what for, and then. Supervisor had to pick on somebody, had to blame somebody. Of course, 
he blamed me, and I said, well, I didn't know Diefenberger was aboard the airplane. Nobody told me, you know, so what could I do? But anyway, I was, uh, I was labeled with the guy that lost Diefenberger for the next six months, so I mean, that, that was my introduction to, uh, to ATC. And, and I had a few of those over the years, too, by the way, so I mean, if there's more incidents, I mean, no, so. And you were also, uh, you were on a plane once with an actual bomb scare back in the day. Yeah, too, right? I was, yeah. Can you tell a radio friendly version of that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. I won't, I won't use the bad words. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I was on a, on a, on a familiarization flight with uh, Eastern Provincial and uh, 737. We were going uh, uh, to Montreal and uh, and I was uh, I was assigned to being part of the flight crew, so I was sitting in the on the flight deck and, and the jump seat. And uh, we landed in uh, Halifax, and uh, everything was going normal. And you know, and the guy, the two crew members were very friendly, and we were chatting back and forth. And so anyway, we we depart, and just as we get airborne, the tower uh, calls the uh, the flight, and he said, "Just been informed by your company." that there's a bomb on board, wow. and you're cleared back to the airport for an approach. So the uh, captain came back and he said, just one moment there, uh, Tower, we'll get back to you. So he looked over at uh, his co-pilot and he says, uh, Ray, what do you think? Blow up in Charlottetown or blow up in Halifax, oh, right? <laughs> well, Ray <clears throat> made an expression uh, that you can imagine what it was. Uh, Let's blow up in Charlottetown, right? Well, I tell you, you know, like I just about fainted right there on the spot. You know, I was trembling. I didn't know what to do. So he, he sort of like uh, said, "Settle down, Jack. Don't you be so silly." You know, like uh, there's no bomb on board. I've been in, and I've been on a dozen of those flights. You know, like who's going to put a bomb? He said, "That's some son of a gun." And I won't say he said son of a gun, but he's that son of a gun down in in Halifax missed his flight and he wants us to go back. Said, we're not going to give him the benefit. He said, "We're going on." So anyway, we landed in Charlottetown and. And uh, so he calls up the flight attendant and he tells you what's going on. He said, we're going to park the airplane over here in this, in this uh, little area. And I want you to get the passengers out. And I don't want to tell them until they get out, until you, we just about stop. So there was no panic. So anyway, I'm sitting in the seat. And I say to the captain, right, and I says, listen. And because the door is right next to it, uh, right next to the cockpit. I said, can I be the first one out of this airplane? And he said, sure. So as soon as we landed and stopped, I was out of my seat and I was waiting for the, <laughs> someone to open up the door. So anyway, the captain is very, very uh, uh, upset about the delay in the schedule. And he's complaining to the security people and saying, come on, come on, guys, come on, get the, you know, check the bags. There's no bomb on board this airplane. There's no bomb on board. So anyway, they finally clear the airplane. We get aboard. We just take off, right? And we're sitting back. And everybody's nice and relaxed now, you know. Next stop is Montreal. And the captain looks over at the co-pilot and he says, wouldn't it be upset those security guys now if this airplane blew up here right now? <laughs> well, that put me right back again, right? I mean, there I was. It was the worst flight of my life, but believe me, you know. <laughs> but, uh, what year was this roughly? This was roughly about 1973, 1974, okay. in, that, in that period of time. <laughs> so, when, when did uh, Terry Hart start reporting around here? Terry, come on over, too, for the uh, chat. Yeah, oh, Terry, Terry, Terry was the, the voice of CKGA at, at right. one time, right? <laughs> well, that would have been the uh, early 70s? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You were just a kid at a, at a, at a college. I still or am. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was around the uh, late 60s or early 70s and yep. started there. What was this lounge like back then? What, like what, because th th there was other stuff happening here, right? So yeah. uh, well, give us a description. Jack, you can help me. There used to be a big bar down there, right? The Big Dipper? Big Dipper, yeah. yeah. And, Bar and, and Barry's Gift Shop. And Barry's Gift Shop, correct. Yeah. 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 And uh, people come off the planes, like you just come down through here over the uh, escalator and yeah. that kind of thing. and. Yeah. So and it, so it, was, it, was a, it happened the spot because you had the locals mixing up with people getting off the international flights, and they were you know all mingling together here. Later on, of course, with all the defects, you changed all the rules. They had to have the separate airport, right? Mm -hmm. So who was it? which of you guys was telling the story about the owner of the Dodgers coming in and buying yeah, stuff? I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Walter O'Malley was the owner of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And they came in on this private airplane, and he went into the gift shop, and they had some very, very expensive cutlery in there. Actually, it wasn't cutlery; it was it was uh, china, 
uh, it was Irish linen china, and it's very, very, very thin china, and it's very expensive. And he came in and he bought a full dinner set. I don't know how many thousands of dollars it cost him. I don't know, not thousands of dollars, but at least a thousand dollars worth of just plates and dishes and, and dessert plates and, and cups and saucers and everything. It was unbelievable. You know, so uh, now that's the kind of things that used to happen there. You know, and that gift shop was was pretty it was pretty expensive oh, too. Yeah, everything there. Absolutely, and like I say, the bar was very popular. And but it was along the it was the whole length of the uh, airport back there. You know, and this nice uh, seats and tables and all that. And I remember uh, one story sticks in my mind when Mohammed Ali came here on his way from Moscow to New York. He was over there for. A few weeks and uh, came here for a refueling stop. And he came through here, and there was a guy uh, cleaning the floors and mopping up, and right here, Mohammed <laughs> went over and started shadow boxing with him and all that kind of stuff. And he met with the locals, very friendly, and that kind of stuff. You never see it today. No, not like that, hey? No. no. And not only that, but the, the, the Mounties, uh, they had a detachment here, RCMP detachment here in the, at right. the terminal at, yep. at the time. And, and so he wanted to meet, he, he wanted to, the, the, to meet the Mounties. And, and they, of course, he wanted to, in, uh, with their dog, they had a dog there, and, uh, and they got a big picture of about four or five guys, Mounties sitting or standing around them, right? So uh, you know, that's still, that was, a, that was a pretty big item that was in the papers. Yeah. Another story, just mm -hmm. storytelling that comes to mind is uh, one day Castro was coming through from Havana on his way to the United Nations. We feel only stop here. And before he landed, there was two American U.S. fighter jets had landed to refuel about an hour before. So when he came in, right there, and came down the steps of the escalator, and he saw the two American uh, dressed in their Army uh, uniforms, U.S. Army uniforms, or flight uniforms, their Air Force, and uh, he got very angry with the local airport manager, Jack James, because how do you let these people, they're here to assassinate me and that kind of stuff, right? So how, why are they here? You know, that kind of, so that was a very interesting afternoon. <laughs> and you're just hanging, like, for, through, like, for reporting back then, yeah. where are you? Like, are you just hanging out in the lounge? Are you when, out front in your uh, car? Yeah, when that accident, incident happened yeah. with the Castro and the, uh, I was up there on those steps looking down, watching, right? And that kind of stuff, and taking the line, they were there right here, walking right here. So, but I was around the airport a lot. I had some great connections. So, if there was something going on, I used to get a call and head out for the airport. And you got involved with the hijack, the TWA yes. hijack too. Yes. You know, and you you were you were yeah, sausage well, on board, right? Yeah, that's right. That's a yeah. I'm glad you remind me of that one. Uh, I started my summer vacation. I don't know how much time we got left, but oh, we had, we had uh, okay. Uh, six, seven minutes. Okay. First time. I started my summer vacation. It was a nice July night, uh, about midnight or 11:30. I got a call at the house. Uh, there's a plane on its way from New York to Chicago. Uh, it's been hijacked. They're going to Montreal. Going to go to Gander, to, to Croatians. They were trying to get back to Ch no, they Czech. No, they come from Montreal yeah. to, to Gander to, to, to go Gander, to Europe. To yeah. go to Europe, yeah. And they were going to, uh, to make, you had to come here to refuel, right? So eventually made the way here about three or four o'clock in the morning or two or three. And uh, after a while, they were parked right down the end of the runway, away from everybody. They were all supposed to be armed with explosives and guns and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so after about an hour down in the runway, they let about 30 passengers off the flight. And there was an Inspector Vaughn who came in from Ottawa off the RCMP. And he came up to me and said, listen, they want to talk to somebody from the media and we want you to go out. And I said, I'm not going out there, <laughs> right? You know, I said, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not crazy. Mm. Uh, maybe I was, but anyway, after a while, they came back in and asked me again about 10 minutes later. I said, okay, I'll go, go out. So anyway, I was going to up here to get in the police car, go down to the runway and see what was going to happen. But just as I was getting in the police car, they got a call from the hijacker saying, no, it was all off, now we're going. So they left here, I think they went to Iceland or Greenland. Uh, no, landed Iceland, yeah. Iceland? Yeah. Okay. Went to London and stopped there. Went to Paris. They got landed in Paris and the local police force came out and shot the tires from under the plane so they couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. So they eventually surrendered, right? 
Interesting. I was working that I was working that night, yeah. and and, and, uh, and uh, the, the amazing part about it is that uh, they they weren't really set up to handle negotiations. Uh, uh, so what they had to use was the ATC frequencies. So there was a tower, uh, the, the fellow in the tower, and he was trying to convince the, the hijackers to give up their their weapons and, and get off the airplane. And we were in the control center listening to all this. Not only that, but 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 you could have been a, a home in, and with a with a radio VHF radio yes, and did. listened to it. You know, like it was public, yeah. but it was that hour in the morning. Everybody was asleep. You know, so yeah. I mean, but it was it well, was it was crazy quite, times. Oh, I yeah, tell you, yeah. you know, it was, it was scary it was, times, right? It was you interesting. Didn't know. You know, you didn't know. You know mm -hmm. No, like I said, uh, like those incidents happen, and and like I said, Terry was the only guy that used to report these things because uh, we certainly weren't going to go out and tell anybody, because you know, right. you know. But there's so many people came to her as uh, Jack and. Verify that you know. Interview Brezhnev, but Castro, three times I think. Uh, Mohammed Ali and President Tito from Yugoslavia, yeah. and all these people came through here because Skander was the spot, right? They all had to refuel here to get down to the states or wherever they were going, or or the other way. Same thing, right? Yeah. So a lot of history. Yeah, like back then, it's anyone who you would find on the cover of Time or Life magazine would have been coming through yeah. through the doors here, which is, and so put that into today's terms and think about, it would be anyone who's anyone of note yeah. would have been passing through, which just, it always, always blows my mind. Yeah, absolutely, and, and like I said, they, they did for a lot of years, and yeah. some, go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say, uh, and Terry was the only person in North America to, to, to talk to uh, Fidel Castro yeah. and, to, and to do an interview with him. Like the only person in North America, yeah. you know, it's unbelievable. And you know, like nearly where there's Terry working at a gander, yep. you know, like <laughs> g g give him the worst spot in, in you know, for news, <laughs> and, and was the highest spot for yeah, news. Absolutely, <laughs> more stories broke here than anywhere. Like the Arrow air crash was a major tragedy, and you know that impacted so many people for a long time. Right, yeah. Jack? After yeah. and yeah. covering that was uh, quite an experience. You know, as I I think I mentioned to you before, I'm on the broadcast. I was able to cross the airport here, the terminal, and uh, there was a lot of reporters here coming from all over the world that mm -hmm. day that it happened, and there was only a few payphones here, maybe four or five, and two reporters from the states got in the big fight over who was going to get to the phone. <laughs> and I mean a physical altercation, right? <laughs> So great stories. Yeah. Well, and it was just great memories. And when we, when you mention that crossroads of the world, right? That that slogan for when you come into town, those stories, you're like, oh, yeah, no, it was right. I can yeah. I can see why it was called that back then. Yeah. And don't forget too, uh, uh, one thing that's that's missing about all this, is that Gander Airport was the airport that started the transatlantic traffic. Yeah. Right. And there was no. There was a, 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 a first airplane that left to go to, o overseas was in 1945, actually, in the summer of 1945. It was a overseas national airways that left Gander for the first flight to go overseas with passengers on And there board. were, what, Jack, hundreds of flights today? At yeah. Some, you know, if they were in the back in the 50s, there were hundreds yeah. coming in from crisscrossing from Europe to North America. Gander was the spot. Yeah. And 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 all those uh, all those flights that came in. I mean, it was a it was about a 12-hour flight across the ocean, and uh, they had to be had to be fed, and so all the catering was done here in Gander. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had caterers like I mean, there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meals a day prepared for those flights. You know, Jack mentions uh, 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I flew on the Concorde. Yeah, that's right. From yeah. Gander to London, two hours. 22 minutes going over, two hours, 16 minutes coming back. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Terry was selected to go on the Concord. Yeah. I mean, that was uh, that was a, a treat in yeah, itself. It how, how was the food on the Concord back then? Well, the story that was here early in the morning. I think I got the flight around six o'clock. It was going. It was already had coming over from London, and they were serving caviar, pheasant under glass. <laughs> and I was a bad boy the night before, and out and had a few 
drinks with a couple of my friends here in Gander, so I wasn't in the mood for anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I got to wrap this up. Uh, thanks for this. Oh, I really yeah, appreciate no it. Sweat, man. This is cool. I love just sitting I mean, and talking about stories. We'll just give you a touch of the stories, a touch of them. We'll, just, I mean, yeah, we'll have more. to book another one, and we'll have to do one <laughs> podcast wise so we can do uh, all the all the words that were actually used. Uh, yeah. All right, Terry Hart, Jack Pinson, thank you so much, folks. That is it for uh, day two in Gander, right? Eclipse one day, aviation history another. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, Back in St. John's for tomorrow's show, I've got uh, some recent conversations uh, for what we're calling the Signal Talks. It's where I sit down with folks, they talk about their lives. The, the, the broad theme is, uh, is perseverance, and it's, it's stuff that I think connects all of us through the, the through lines for these stories. Taking us out, just a, a little touch of, uh, I think we've got some John Denver to take us out to stick with the theme for the day. Uh, thanks again. We'll talk to you tomorrow.